You're listening to Two Guys Talking Wine with Michael Pincus and Andre Pru. Michael. Clink, clink, clank. <laughs> there's, there's certain times that I, I feel like filling glasses at a certain level and then getting like a, like a chopstick and giving a ding, 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 ding. Now I feel like Donald Trump. Sorry. Yeah, that was Sorry. mildly uh, mildly racist, but we'll uh, we'll let it slide. No, no, it wasn't racist. It was uh, it was you know Trump these days is doing the ting tang tong thing. Oh my god! Can we just no? This is a Donald Trump free zone. All right, all right, okay, all right. Um, okay, so I'm actually really excited about what we're doing today. Um, you know, I I'm a big fan of, of stories. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of like those urban legends that get out of hand and become larger than life like uh ford v ferrari did you see the movie i did that that is one of my favorite like stories that e- e- exist and did, that you, mov- did you see the movie ferrari just the ferrari movie i have not seen just the ferrari movie oh. i saw the lamborghini movie which was terrible because that's another story that i love didn't, but like just, didn't just see that but i but but like, ferrari just, was a good movie good movie so so but it's just, just to summarize ford v ferrari like what happened was in the 1960s the ford mortar company like pickup trucks and you know police cars the ford interceptor like this company was getting ready to save ferrari from financial ruin we're about to buy ferrari and enzo ferrari like on the day the contract was supposed to be signed basically said screw you guys and sent them packing back to detroit and what happened in the 1960s and i'm sorry i'm 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 not spoiling the movie still go see the movie you know who bought Fiat. Fiat, Fiat saved saved Ferrari, but but the, so now you've got to watch. You actually have to watch Ferrari as the movie to get the to compendium. get the other part. Okay, yes. okay. So I'm going to watch Ferrari after this. What happened after this was that Henry Ford the second, the son of Edsel Ford, the grandson of Henry Ford, decided to embarrass and destroy Ferrari and went all out and developed the Ford GT40. One of the greatest cars to ever exist on this planet. Won the 24 Hours of Le Mans three years in a row, 66, 67, 68. Maybe it was four years in a row. Either way, just this whole idea that being insulted by Enzo Ferrari was enough to just go all out. So a lot of you sitting here listening to this podcast right now are wondering, Andre, what does Ford v. Ferrari have to do about wine? What does Ferrari have to do with anything? Well, actually, Ferrari has a lot to do with wine. They actually make wine. Well, there we go, but so that's they, not where we're going. Great sparkling wine, if you can get your hands on it. Okay. It's not exp- <laughs> It's not inexpensive, too. It's like 25 Now, Now I actually feel like this is an episode of The Muppet Show, and you're, you're, we're Statler and Waldler here. It's, it's time to play the music. <laughs> it's time to light the lights. So we're about to interview the winemaker from Penfolds. Yes. And, and Penfolds is another winery that has that great story. I've been lucky enough. Have you tasted the Grange? Uh, I don't know if I've tasted a Grange. I've tasted a, a DRC. I, I've, I've got to taste Grange. Do you, do you know the story behind Grange? Uh, it, it's tickling the back of my mind. But I'll uh, let you tell it. I, I'm going to see if Andrew will tell us like his version. So I'm going to go through like the long and short of it. Is that basically... In the I, if, and he'll correct me on my. There's dates. a secret part of me hoping that you're so wrong, and that he tells a story <laughs> that, is, that is so different from what. So you're I, I'm hoping the story's correct, but the dates might be wrong. Is in about the 1950s, um, everything in Australia was making sweet wine. They were making port style wines and not making dry table wines. And the winemaker at the time at Penfolds had kept aside some clandestine barrels that eventually became the Grange. And when those wines saw the light of day, got the international accolades, got the local accolades, then Penfolds it, it, it essentially redirected the direction of the company. So I, I've been enamored with the story. I've been fortunate enough. I, I got to taste the wine when I went to um, uh, Robert Mondavi. That was part of their Tokolon program. One of the gl- wines they let you taste is the Grange. And it's actually the thing where I wish I had a time machine because... I remember when I started to learn about the Grange, I remember reading about it in um, Drops of God, the great manga that I've recommended on this and a, a show on Apple as well, is the wines were going for about 500, 400 bucks a bottle, which is still a lot of money. Mm. But current vintages of the Grange that roll through the LCBO are, are trading at like 2,000 bucks. Yep. And like at, at, at that point, it's hard to justify spending the money. 
So, do you want to stop burying the lead and tell them everybody what we're doing here now? I already did. I said we're interviewing the winemaker from Penfolds. Correct, Penfolds. but now we're going to taste the wines that, that showed oh! up. Oh, yeah, but we don't have a bottle of the Grange. So no, we're going to bury the lead on that. Grange, but, so, we're going to taste the wines before we talk to the winemaker. Uh, and then uh, that way we are prepared for what he's going to be talking about. And um, so during the interview, uh, when you hear us talking about the wines, you will know that secretly, shh, we've already tasted them. So <laughs> we'll fake it with him. Um, so the first wine that we actually have here is a Bin 311 Chardonnay. Uh, Andre saw this and suddenly became very excited. Actually, that's not true. That's not true. I asked questions about whether or not this was going to be over the top obnoxious Chardonnay because um, that, that that is that is the uh, legacy, I guess, right now. Well, of, and the thing uh, is, like, we've tasted the Wakefield Chardonnay, which is like it's good, but it's also like twenty odd dollars a bottle. And it still has a little bit of. I've li- I've liked a few of the Wakefields a little bit better lately. It it is, uh, what I've noticed uh, is that for the most part Australia is starting to pull back from oak, which is uh, which we have talked about many times is a universal thing. Yeah. Within the wine world, which is good. So here we are with the uh, the three eleven the twenty twenty two. This is this is big. This is a big wine. I can still smell the the, it's got the a lot butterscotch, of yeah. the vanilla, but it does also have like citrus. But it's hard citrus. It's like lemon, but it's also like it's Meyer lemon, like just a little bit of, of, of sweetness to it. Yeah, there's there's some fruit here. But it's still, it's still, no pun intended, mired in oak. Um. Okay. Okay. You are on the tail end of a head cold. I'm going to give you a, a slight mulligan on this, and this is one where I need you to trust me. I know you don't usually defer to. to okay, you blew your nose and had a bit of a reaction. I'm not going to lie and say like this is what I imagine when I imagine warm climate Chardonnay. Um. But the acid is really nice on it. Yeah, see, it's, they're starting to learn to, to to deal with some of that of that acidity, and it's I, I really like the Wakefields lately. Uh, the way they're handling the Chardonnay, the sixteen ninety five Chardonnay has been really good the last two vintages. Um, this one is not bad. Like it's still there's still a little bit of that vanilla cream kicking around in here, but but it's lifted. But it, it it's not as heavy on the tongue that it's that lifted is, it, it, well if that's what you want to call it yeah it, it's not uh it's not overpowering the wine um i could drink this i could drink this are we going to do thumbs up or thumbs down or do we think that's not fair in case we're going to crap on a bunch of wines and talk to the winemaker um i'm not we're not going to crap on that i'm i'm a <sighs> for me this wine says guilty pleasure this is not like my 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 cellar's gone really cool climate in terms of Chardonnay, but this is one where I, I crave wines like this once in a while. This, this is a thumbs up for me. Uh, I will. Uh, there's a part of me that wants to go down, but uh, there's also a part of me that wants to go up. And then we're you told me there's no uh, there's no no waffling no waffling, and that was my own rule as well. I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna go up. It's <laughs> it's um, because because uh, I think I think for the most part it's because of what expectations were and what the reality is. Yeah, I mean, this is not like an an everyday Chardonnay, and like don't go into this expecting don't go into this expecting Burgundy. This is unapologetic australian australia california kind but but still with it's not kistler no which is where you know just you know clobbered with oak <laughs> this is it's not mer soleil which is again uh, terribly oaky this is um this is uh it, it has fruit it's it's got a nice balance to it there's really uh, there's there's some nice components here that I'm I, I, I'm liking. 
Ooh, look at the color on this. So this is a dark uh, Cabernet Shiraz. Uh, bin 389. Bin 389, 2020, I think. Yep. This is this is what I was looking forward to because when I think of Penfolds, I think about big red wines. I'll tell you, that's wow. That's the smell on it. Granted, I, it's it's cut through the head cold. Yes, I did blow <laughs> the nose a little bit. Yeah, this is this is uh, that mocha. White pepper, oh, cassis, like super. This this Black reminds berry. me of Black Current Jam. There's some chocolate kicking around in this too. This is this is hedonistic wine, but it 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 doesn't feel. Whew, it doesn't feel over the top. Like there's some nice smoke mm. to it. There is like some What's, some some charred cedar. You have the bottle on your side. What's the alcohol? I want to okay. say it's fourteen and a half, but I would not. Um, if you, you you could lie to me and tell me it's thirteen and a half. It's fifty one percent Cabernet Sauvignon, forty nine percent Shiraz. It's fourteen five yeah. alcohol. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there's a lot going on in here. Uh, wow, it's um, a big thumbs up. Let's start there. Yeah, this is definitely a big thumbs up. See, this is the one where we talk about the direction that world winemaking is is taking. Is like there is definitely a lot of barrel influence on this, but it's not overly barrel. No, but the, but the, that fruit is is forefront. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things that I learned when I was in Cyprus is one of the winemakers said, "If the wine has fruit, then it'll age. If it's got spice or wood or oak, it won't." And he said it this way. He said, if you put an apple or if you put a strawberry on your counter and just let it age, you know, things will happen to it. Um, you know, it'll change. But if you put a piece of, of spice or a piece of wood on your counter, what happens? Nothing. And 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 there's there's fruit forefront here, and then there's that there's that spicy, oaky characteristic that sits at the bottom. Uh, are at, at the base of this wine, and and I and I do believe that this will age gracefully, really well. This is wow. I think this has a, a really long life ahead of it, but I also think that this is definitely approachable, approachable in its youth. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would do with a bit of decanting, like yeah. There's the, the tannins starting to hit my my, my inner cheeks. Well, I feel like I've been uh, sucking on some cotton balls. Yeah, there's definitely a coffee note to it. There's that mocha, the chocolate, the dark chocolate. There's a there's that's really a lovely a lovely wine. Um, you, you you can see with a wine like that why uh, Penfolds has the reputation it does for red wines. I mean, I'll I'll be honest, even not the it's, grange it's, stuff. It's it's no grange. No, but I mean, it's, but I mean, if you can't afford two thousand dollars for grange, a hundred dollars on this is like. That's that's a lovely that's a lovely <laughs> piece of winemaking. All right, all right, all right. So we've got, I think, what might be a bit of a unicorn in our head because I certainly wasn't expecting this when um, when Mark Anthony helped us line up this interview. I'm you, looking you, at you looked at the, you looked in the bag and you said there's a, a champagne from Penfolds and I'm like it's a sparkling wine and then you said no, no it's, it's champagne. a champagne and you handed me the bottle and champagne is written right in the middle of it and I'm like what the hell is this so. I guess we're going to have questions. Yeah, uh, Andrew will have to do some splaining. Uh, but here we go. This is an actual uh, champagne, and it's a rosé. All right. Let me let me inspect the bottle. You inspect the wine. I'll inspect the bottle. Let's see if we can get to the bottle. It, so it definitely is a pink wine. So, so um, no reading the bottle top to bottom, Champagne Tieno. So there's the Champagne House, X Penfolds, an extraordinary collaboration. Champagne Brut Rosé, product of France on the back. Champagne Brut Rosé... Oh, I hate it when this happens. Like there is literally, there's no story. Like you know how you get those like crappy teaser trailers, like yeah, two gotta, years before a movie comes out. Where we got to figure out what's going on here because this. Okay, so it does say cuvee selected by Penfolds. Okay, so uh, so 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 I'm. But it is a brut rosé, so let's start there. But it's all, it also means it's champagne brut rosé, which means either Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, this is like really red and juicy. 
See, I, I hate a lot of uh, champagne, rosé champagne, because I like rosé sparkling wines to be a little bit more opulent and juicy. And usually, like, when we taste the really good stuff, like Krug Rosé, which I've tasted a few times, is like, like, what's the point? It's it's pink, but it doesn't smell like raspberries or cherries anymore. Yeah, there's a there's a real nice, yeah, this has got some really nice notes to it. Some strawberry. There's a little bit, of, little oh, like a hint of cherry. There's some red. It's a currants. lot of raspberry for me. All right, I, I have more questions than answers, but we're not going to get to them. From not not this. here, but uh, I know you hate when I do this, but uh, that that's a Lionel Richie wine. Oh my All god! All night long, oh my baby. God. That's also got me dancing on the <sighs> ceiling as well. So that's. I really like that one. You mean like Christopher Walken and Weapon of Choice? No, that's also a Lionel Richie song. Sorry. Can we update your pop culture oh, references? Oh, no, I had to go with that one. That one was really good. Okay, I know I have to up my game now that I have a, a little girl that I have to up my dad joke game because like we've been doing this podcast for like five plus years and all your pop culture references are like, they're so Gen X they hurt. Oh, this is this is the Eras tour, baby. How's that? Want me to bring it right in there? This is really good. This is really good. I'm really So you've gone from Lionel Richie to Tay Tay? Yeah. You're a Taylor Swift fan? No. I am not. I, I like some of her stuff, but Okay. You know I, what? I have you... nothing against like all the power to her, man. Like she is Oh, she's printing money. She, I... Yeah, she's she's you know, rule the world. Go for it. Okay, can I tell you what I did today? Do I want to know? I'm actually like, I'm really, really pleased. And it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things of living in Hamilton. Cause I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast live in the Niagara region. And I was a proud Torontonian until I moved to Hamilton. They kind of grew on me. Some 41 announced their last concerts in Toronto. And earlier this week, and uh, when you're listening to this, it's, it's definitely been a few weeks past, but earlier this week, they announced the last leg of their Canadian tour. One of the places they're playing is in St. Catharines. Really? Where? And I got four is it tickets. like the Meridian Center? Or? Four tickets to see Gob opening for some 41 at the Meridian Center. And I'm oh. really excited to Look live down you. here. Oh, well, the Bare Naked Ladies are showing up too. So there you go. <laughs> I don't mind the Bare Naked Ladies, but it's just like, you know, Michael, sometimes I forget that you're like just 10 years older. You know, Rod me. Stewart showing up at the OLG. Right? Oh, my God. All right. So uh, coming up is our interview with uh, Andrew from Penfolds. We're now joined by Andrew Baldwin. He is one of the senior winemakers at Penfolds. Michael, you and I have just tasted through uh, a small lineup of um, Penfolds wines. So a special thanks to Mark Anthony for getting us. Um, I guess, Andrew, what you and I were talking about off, uh, off microphone here as... Uh, Baby Grange is what you said. Correct. Correct. So it's and that's basically, a BIN 389. Uh, yes, correct. So, uh, which is a cab, Cabernet Shiraz. So, um, yeah, it's called, uh, it, it's called, um, Baby Grange or Poor Man's Grange. Um, so anything that, that I guess the realms of the, the story came, came about when, uh, Max Schubert, the founder of Penfolds Grange or the creator, um, basically, uh, it was creating Grange first and then after Grange, after he created the top echelon of wine first, he decided to create wines underneath it. So to protect the to protect Grange, anything that uh, didn't quite make the top echelon would fall down into uh, 389. So hence the name Baby Grange. <laughs> so so what – can you explain what the – either the origin or why you call these wines – Everything's in bin. So why? Yes, why, where, where does the bin idea come from? The bin comes from the underground drives. So obviously, wineries many years ago, even here in Australia, were underground cellars. So all the wines were stored in the underground, what we call drives, um, and each one of the drives had a number. They called it a bin, so a batch identification number. So you know when Max would put. And same as what your credit card is these days. Everything's got a bin number on it um, as well. You know, they're batch identification numbers. So basically underground, um, originally it was bin one, two, three, four, five, six. And then Max would store the wines in bin one. So it was easy for him to say, can you go to bin one and take out the 1951 Grange, please? 
and they would bring it up to to Max in the winery. So the bins were originally where their storage origins were at McGill Estate Winery, which is the home, the original home of Penfolds uh, in Adelaide, South Australia. Well, there we go. That makes sense. I mean, that's sort of what I would have guessed the, the story would be. Um, yeah. One thing we I do want to just get like off the table here at the beginning is in the it was in the the tasting part of the podcast that you didn't hear Mike and I were talking about the origin story of Grange and that's just one of my favorite like mythical stories of you know sort of happy accidents or clandestine winemaking but I was just wondering if you could clear the record and tell us in uh, in your words or the Penfolds words like what happened well, how did the Grange come to be. Well, it was originally, uh, obviously, Max Schubert is the, uh, was the original and first chief winemaker of the company. So outside of a, a family member making wine for Penfolds, making, and the origins of Penfolds were uh, fortified wines. So outside of the family, Max Schubert, uh, a local Barossa Valley boy, um, started working for the company as a, as a, as a, as a paper boy. And then um, obviously graduated into winemaking, did his degree, and then basically uh, had an idea. He got sent by the business to Portugal and Spain to study the origins of, of Fortified. And, but he, he had this really interest on uh, what was happening in Bordeaux. So on his trip, he decided to call back through Bordeaux and look at, the, at, look at the, all of the first growths. So... And he had the same idea. You know, his origins were wanting to produce wines um, like Bordeaux that were crafted for time. So the timeless wines. So he had this big interest of creating a wine that was based in Australia from what we actually had here. And most of the varieties here at the time were obviously the Rhone varieties. So they were planted from fortified origins, so from the southern part of Rhone. So we had lots of Shiraz, we had uh, Mataro, we had obviously lots of Grenache. So he was trying to adapt an idea and he thought of uh, of Penfold's Grange, which is actually made from Syrah grape because that was the, the variety that was planted here in Australia, um, I guess the, the largest variety planted here in this part of the world. So, uh, and with obviously warm conditions that Australia has in this part of the world as well. So um, his origins were just to start and produce a wine that had the, the longevity um, so, uh, and hence he formulated, uh, Penfold's Grange. And then we have the stories where, you know, in, uh, the, the company decided that they didn't want to, they didn't want Max to create Grange anymore. So 57, 58 and 59, he was told to stop making Grange. So the end of 1956, because, um, I guess journalists at the time were saying, why would uh, anybody buy a, um, a, a dry steel wine, let alone drink it, um, you know, of of large tannin and, and, and you know, sort of big flavour. So he was just told to stop um, making the wine. So he crafted the wines in secret in the McGill's of uh, McGill Estate, uh, away from prying eyes and away from the family. So he crafted 1957, 58 and 59 in secret. Um, and then in 1960, uh, the three vintages were released at the same time. So, um, but the family decided that it, I think it did really well overseas in um, in basically uh, show wine. So I think the Olympiad in Paris it did very very well. So the company and the family decided to create the wines again. But Max, unbeknown to them, had the 57, 58, and 59 all cellared. So they, they're actually quite rare and quite hard to find Granges as well. So what is the first year of the Grange? 1951 was uh, when it was first. There was a, and, they're, and they're the rarest of, of obviously the all, you know, the first and the smallest batch that was probably ever produced um, was the 1951. And really for the first 10 years, Max gave a lot of it away. You know, a lot of it was given to friends and that's, that's why we generally tend to see uh, you know, these wonderful old granges in, in people's because they're all given to Max's friends and acquaintances and um, and they were all put away because nobody at that particular time knew what the wine was all about. So people just, you know, hid them away. And and today, you know, you'll see a, a 1951 here in Australia sell for 180000 Australian dollars. I, I was option. I was just going to say, I can I, I, I found a bottle on winesearcher.com of one bottle of the 1951 Penfolds Grange at a German wine shop in Hamburg. 
And it's listed at one hundred and thirty-one thousand dollars. Yes, and, you, and look, you ask your that's own. Canadian. One hundred thirty-one thousand dollars Canadian. It does the conversion. It looks like nineteen fifty-two was a little bit more accessible, but I mean, we can get one from uh, from Langton's Fine Wines. Uh, do you know that yes. that shop? Okay, yes, so yep. they've, they've got Langton's, a bottle. We do a lot with Langton's. So, so they've got a bottle for twenty, like only twenty-two thousand dollars Canadian. It's just chump change, right, Michael? Yeah, we're we're <laughs> pulling our money for that one. <laughs> but then he he also did things like Grange has always been Syrah or Shiraz. So with small amounts of Cabernet added into it. But in 1953, it's the only one that's ever been done. You can find a Shiraz Grange and you can find a Cabernet Grange. The only (laughs) time it's ever been done in 70 odd years. So the 1953 Cabernet Grange is much more valuable than the, than the, than the Shiraz because it's a, it's a one off. Only one was ever created. I love that. You know, has there ever been a thought of doing that again, just for the fun of it? Thoughts. There's always thoughts, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess that was that was Max's legacy as well. He always wanted you know younger winemakers, the winemaking team, to come into the harvest, uh, come into the vintage with new ideas every single year. So he challenged the winemaking team to to create different things over over the new harvests coming out every single year. So. He was certainly a dynamic person as well. So, um, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That's okay. So the good news is I got most of the story correct. I didn't get the, I didn't mention anything about the Bordeaux side of it. So you definitely gave a bit more texture to the story, but like, it's a, it's a really cool story. Yeah. I mean, he just wanted to, you know, be sure that he was crafting wines and he always had this idea of, um, and then that time when he was traveling in France, I think it was 1948. 48, 49, he actually saw a large vintage and they were actually, to save space in the winery, they're actually finishing the fermentation, which is not a usual thing in, in, uh, in Bordeaux. They were finishing the fermentation in barrels because they'd run out of space. So they didn't have any space, so they're actually finishing the fem- because generally they'll actually finish their fermentation to dry yep. on skins. But because they were so constricted for room, he saw them running wine off at sweetness, still with sugar in it, into a barrel. So all our grange, still to this day, is run off with sugar in it and finish the fermentation in a barrel. So we don't ferment to dryness in Australia with Shiraz. We actually only go down to around two Bome because we've extracted all of the colour in the first eight, nine days of fermentation. Then once there's a little bit of sugar in, we put it to an American oak barrel to finish as a fermentation. We believe we get wonderful integration with the oak rather than the still wine just sitting there. The fermentation, the warmth, the depth, it actually heats the barrel a little bit and draws a lot more um, from the actual barrel and you get this much better integration of, of oak and fruit uh, at the same time. So all of our Grange and all of our 707 and parts of Little Baby Grange a finished fermentation in a in a American oak barrel. That, that does been? explain a little bit there, Andre. As far as the uh, when we tasted the wine, that that we we were mentioning that that it, while it had oak characteristics, it wasn't overly oaky. No, the the balance was no. great. Like like smoke notes. But the thing is, I I would have never guessed um, American oak on this. Like, has it always been American oak, or is that something that evolved 100%. over? That's fascinating like, to me. Hundred percent. So. It's finished in a 100% American oak fermentation and then maturated for another, well, you know, it's 18 to 24 months maturation, all 100% American oak. So we rack once it's finished fermentation, once it's gone through its malolactic fermentation, we rack out of the barrel and put it back to the same barrels. <laughs> and is it, is it, it's not all new barrels, I'm assuming? 100% like- new. <laughs> Yes. So it's so really it's about the concentration of fruit. So what we see here in Australia and some of our vineyards, it's all about the concentration of fruit. So we see much smaller berries, but what we're seeing also is because we're not governed by Appalachian, we're able to source fruit from everywhere. So what we tend to have is we have a little region to the north of us called Clare, 
we have McLaren Vale just to the south of the city of Adelaide. And Max, in his wisdom, through his when he became chief winemaker, he actually planted vineyards within all these different regions. So spreading the risk, but he wanted characters from all those different regions. McLaren Vale is by the coast. You know, Clare is inland, but a very narrow, cool, um, small region. Um, and then Coonawarra is five hours south of, uh, you know, great for Cabernet. Um, so he wanted to spread the risk, but what he did was take elements from all those different regions and all those different elements come together for one great thing, which is Grange. So you're looking for all the different elements. Claire's got wonderful aromatics. Um, McLaren Vale has some lovely earthiness and spiciness. And Barossa Valley has the richness, you know, has the depth and the darkness. So all these little things put together, it's about winemakers then being able to blend and coming up with the creation of, of Grange. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's understanding what you're looking for in those elements. And, and Andrew, these, these interviews are always the ones that are the most fun because Michael and I haven't had to really ask you anything. We've sort of just mentioned the word Grange and, and things have, have, have popped off. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 things are no, 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 no. It's a good thing. So, yeah. so, so I, I guess one thing that I've, that I've also done is I've worked with some of the past winemakers. So, so next year I'll be with the business for 40 years. Holy smoke. So, oh. so I've created and crafted some of these um, wonderful wines from, you know, the past winemakers. So I've learned from a gentleman called John Bird who spent, who was the senior winemaker manager with Matt Schubert. And he spent 60 years with the business. You know, my ex-senior winemaker, he was 40 years with the business. So, it's learning from these gentlemen that are traditional and, you know, part of our business is, you know, there's all these different varieties and other things happening in the world of wine, but people expect Grange to look the same as it was in 1951, 1955, you know, 1995, 2005. So it's all about the thumbprint and the blueprint, how we do it. You know, the, the, the technology is a little different now. You know, we use stainless steel back in McGill. They were, you know, they were um, five-ton concrete waxed fermenters. Now it's just stainless steel. So, but we use the same technique, but it's just stainless steel, not not concrete. So we've had to expand, obviously. So the expansion is not done with concrete and wax anymore. It's expanded with stainless steel. So they're the only things that have really changed. You know, the technique of crafting penfolds has always been about the DNA. It's always been about following that map, following that DNA, following that thumbprint uh, of what Penfolds is, is, is all about. And that was crafted by Max and um, instilled in the rest of the winemaking team. It's amazing to hear about all these guys that have been there like 60 years. Yeah, years. I was just thinking like, that. There's some longevity in this company. Like It's not just guys who show up for five years and then, and then take off. No, it's part of it's part of your DNA. I mean, you know, I think when I was, you know, twenty years ago, someone said, you know, you should go to a, a different part and get some more experience in a, you know, more commercial winery. And I said, I can get the experience here, but for me, it's about the love of wine and crafting the best wine that this com- company, this country, has to offer. You know, the really first, true first growth in this country is Penfolds Grange. So for me, it's all about the love of it, the, you know, why I've been here so long. It's about the wine itself. It's about the history. It's about those people that, you know, that I fell in love with and those stories that I, um, that I heard as well and, and, and maintaining that as well, not, not changing it. Um, I still love to craft it and there's talk about it all of the time, you know, whether it's outside our business or whether it's inside our business, there's just so much focus on Penfolds and Penfolds Grange. You know, there's always there's always talk about the chief winemaker. The chief winemaker now is a gentleman called Peter Gago. So he's been with the business for 30 years now. So, you know, I've worked with Peter for, for all that amount of time as well. So we, we took over from John DeVal. So there's only ever been four chief winemakers. So Max Schubert, Don Ditter, um, John DeVal and now Peter Gago. So uh, in the whole history of the 180 years. So this year is our actually 180th 
birthday. Wow. So there's a lot of celebrations around the world. And hence why I was in, um, in Montreal in Canada only, you know, six weeks ago. You know, it's, it's about tra- traveling the world, uh, especially once we finished harvest here in Australia. Uh, we'll, we'll be out celebrating our 180th birthday. Well, <laughs> our invitation must have gotten lost in the mail for that one. Um, well, that was Montreal. Was a, we were Toronto. I guess, so I guess. I'm Any, sure so, they're coming to yes. Toronto at some point. So, Andrew, let me let me just ask you a bit about uh, like like your your career because like, like Michael, you know, we we talked about the wines before. I, I'm I'm just like I'm really curious like to have this wealth of knowledge in, in in front of us here. Like you're not just someone who's only been with the company five ten years or whatever. Like you've seen it all. Um, Correct. What what do you think is, is where does Australian wine exist in the world now? Like, like, is 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 it established as a as a premium thing, and and not just Penfolds Grange, because like that is what it is. That's why we were excited to talk to you. But like, Australian wine as an entity, like, w- what is the state of the the union for Australian wine right now? I guess the state of the union at the moment is um, we were heavily uh, exporting to China. Um, and the China market, obviously, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard or other parts of the world have heard, but um, we had a tariff placed on Australian wine. So at the moment, um, we have a lot of surplus wine uh, because we're not exporting to China because China placed a 220% tariff on Australian wine. Um, Australia asked for the uh, the Australian government at the time in 2020 asked for the origins of COVID and that being China, you know, to investigate the World Health Organization to investigate that. So, uh, and then they decided to place bans on all Australian products going into China. And obviously, being a, such a close um, a neighbour to Australia, um, you know, we had wine, uh, wheat, you know, barley, oats, all those sorts of things. Uh, seafood is a huge exporter into China. They place bans on seafood, uh, live export um, and meat and all those sorts of things. So I think this month, um, by the end of the month, which is not very far away, um, China is supposed to lift those bans. So it's been nearly three and a half years since those bans came into place. So it's obviously placed pressure on the Australian uh, wine industry. So, but it's enabled someone like Penfolds. I mean, I can only speak about Penfolds a little bit. I know that the smaller guys and the smaller businesses have really struggled. There's there's um, wineries, there's vineyards for sale. Um, there's, you know, the commercial section here. Obviously, there's a heavily irrigated section, very much in the middle, sort of northern parts of Victoria over the border from South Australia. Um that are, that are really suffering because a lot of that commercial wine was making its way uh, via bulk wine onto the Chinese market. So that sort of uh, obviously disappeared and the, and the wine prices or the grape prices have actually come down. But what we've seen post-COVID is that, you know, the high-end ultra-premium wines um, like Penfolds and some of the other brands as well have gone up. Because during COVID, people were um, obviously bound uh, in home, in, in, in their homes. So they actually um, consumed higher end wines. They weren't spending money. So let's buy wines. We can get wines into the house. Let's buy wines at a higher end price. So, And that's drifted on post COVID. So we're finding that, uh, you know, things like Grange and our 707 and, and Baby Grange 389 and 407 is actually. Um, we're actually making more of it so um yeah so we've actually been uh, in the, in that target because a lot of our wines are at the higher price and the the premium end of the market so we've actually found ourselves uh, requiring more so but people have found it tough and it's been a tough market uh, for the last three and a half to four years so um but but we uh we're in the uh we're in the market of uh of making more it's actually it's actually expanded our into southeast asia so places like Korea and Japan, we've actually exported more into those countries and gone back into those countries. You know, we we sort of left Japan on the on the on the back burner for a little while, and now we've actually spent a lot more time in Japan uh, and places like that. You know, Thailand, so all the Southeast Asian countries. Taiwan is a is a big importer of Australian wine. So those sorts of things have been happening. And the Canadian so, and the Canadian market. Have we made up with with our Australian friends? I know there was a bit of a, a trade dispute a few years ago between between us with the submarine 
Uh, well, something to do with uh, with taxation and exports and this and that. And no, that. Australia sued us to get uh, get into the market better. Yeah, so I, I guess the um, yes, but the, hence hence our um, push into the market and the Mark Antony Group and um, yeah, getting back into you know Peter, our chief winemaker, um, he does a lot of work and has been doing a lot of work into in in Canada. So you know. Hence, hence, we'll be back in Canada a lot more, and um, yeah, not not putting all our eggs in one basket anymore. I guess it's uh, continuing to expand, and we have the, like I said, we have the global um, country of origin projects, making wines in Napa, China, and Bordeaux now. So um, to take the pressure off the Australian, so it is Australian winemakers producing wines in all those different countries as well. So now, now before we got onto the mic, we were talking about. Penfold's expansion around the globe and not just selling wine, but you were talking about, and it, and it kind of kind of blew us away when you said that uh, Penfold's is not just making Australian wine. You're actually making Correct. wine in California, in, in Bordeaux, uh, and Correct. other parts of the world. Can you tell us about that project? Are those projects? Yeah, I, I guess it was uh, the, you know, the, the gentleman at the time, you know, it wasn't you know, we, we, we lifted the, which was the CEO, a gentleman called Michael Clark at the time, um, decided that we'd had vineyards planted in the US and we had lots of uh, facilities around the world that we could use. Let's, let's, let's put Penfolds as a real global player because we had vineyards already planted from clones here in Australia. So just down the road and the home of Penfolds at McGill, which was founded in, a, in 1844, we took cuttings from those vineyards and put them in the ground in a place called Paso Robles in 1998. So we bought a property in 1996 and then um, we uh, put vines in the ground from clones or cuttings in Australia in the ground in Paso Robles. So 2006, 7 and 8, we actually made wines in Paso Robles on the central coast of California. Um, but they were deemed not good enough for Penfolds. So they went into our library. And then, uh, yeah, in 2017, the gentleman CEO at the time, Michael Clark, wanted to create and craft wines in, uh, in California. So I went over there in 2017, created a pilot project to see if we could use um, not only the vineyard we actually had planted, but the facilities that we had actually in Paso Robles. Um, and then in 2018, the green light was given that we would use uh, not only the fruit from Paso Robles, because Paso Robles is more a, a Rhone region as well, so much warmer, much drier than Napa Valley, um, you know, four hours to the north. Um, so uh, we, uh, we started the, the, the project in 2018 with four different wines. So crafting a, a high-end wine, a uh, very small base, um, with you know high end uh, Napa Cabernet, and then we did a we did a second tier, a third tier, and a fourth tier using the uh, Syrah that was actually planted. But the top two tier wines are actually called wines of the world. Hmm. What's <laughs> a wine of the world? Well, it's actually a wine that's made from Napa Cabernet and Australian Syrah. So we've mixed two hemispheres of wine together in Napa Valley. So we have our vintage or harvest first. We craft the wine and then we send, we blend in different countries. So in the US and in Australia. And then we send a portion of the Australian wine that would be good enough for Penfolds Grange to California and blend in with the Cabernet in California that we've crafted um, you know, six months later. And then the top two weird tier wines are like that. The second wine is called Bin 149, which is a Napa-only Cabernet. But then we use Australian Cabernet, good enough for what was uh, what is our top tier Cabernet in Australia. Um, and we send that to the US as well. So we have this coined term, um, wine of the world. So two hemispheres of wine blended together uh, and then maturated together in Napa Valley in our cellars in Napa, and then uh, and then bottled and released to the to the U.S. market. So and is it is, so is it under the Penfolds name or is it is it absolutely it looks exactly the same? Unfortunately, this is a you've got a pretty bare you've got a pretty bare office. 
Yes, yes. This is only. Uh, this is not my office. This is just a uh, meeting office. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> No, so I, I do think be I do think that's a neat uh, a neat experiment. Like, um, like I said, and at what stage of the of the winemaking is the wine done? So, like, fermentation's completely finished. This is uh, like, like what is it trans- yes, transported in in barrels? Like, is it the barriques that are transported, or is it moved? Into no, it? we actually use stainless steel, so gotcha. you, you can't you can't really transport um, oak either through customs. It's wood. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's wood. So yeah, you've got to be really careful on that, on that sort of thing. So, you know, if you did, the wood would have to be fumigated and things like that. So no, yeah. it's transported in stainless steel. Uh, it only takes about six weeks. Um, or if we decide to fly it, uh, we can fly it as well. So that's obviously only four days, uh, from point of leaving. So we do that. Uh, um, you know, we craft wines in uh, in Bordeaux, and we bring them back the other way, and we craft wines that are, are Bordeaux and Australian esque <laughs> as well. So, and then we fly those around the world as well. So they're flown down to Australia. We blend a little bit of um, of Cabernet, potentially Merlot, into Australian Cabernet here as well. Uh, we have a partnership as well. We've also, you know, we're also crafting uh, champagne. Ah, so there we go. That's, that's my next question for you. Yeah, we 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 read we read so, the label. We read the label out loud, uh, so everyone listening knows about it. And we tasted the rosé uh, champagne yes. yesterday, and when we pulled it out of the, the the box that it was sent to us, Michael was just like, "I said it's it's champagne." He's just like, "Does it say champagne on the bottle?" And like, "Yeah, this is <laughs> it says made in France on it." Yeah, correct. Like, no, so it's 2000 sparkling wine. He goes, no, no, it really says champagne. So, what is that correct. project that you've got going on? So, we've been doing that. Uh, so, 2000 and oh, I'm trying to think now. We released a few years ago. We released the 2012. So, we actually released four champagnes um, from the 2012 vintage. So, we released two single uh, champagnes, two single vineyards, small only 0.4 of a hectare. So what we've got is we've got a partnership with a family called TNA. So TNA is the Champagne House in uh, in France. Uh, they're a sort of new champagne producer in the old world, and we're sort of an old producer in the in the new world. So the the two work really well together. So yeah, so it's been crafted from um, from the chief winemaker. Our chief winemaker Peter Gago has a love of champagne. So um, he happened a new Stanislav is the is the is the winemaker at uh, TNA, and he had a really fantastic uh, relationship with him. And then we've been able to craft these wines in Champagne by the chief winemaker, and then craft the wine. So we actually started out with, like I said, four Champagnes, and then we crafted um, the rosé uh, a year later to bring it into a more, uh, um, I guess, um, more. Uh, user-friendly, more uh, affordable uh, style of champagne, which was the rosé. So, uh, because the other the other champagnes were two hundred and eighty Australian dollars a bottle, the single vineyard wines, which are which are much harder and much smaller, obviously to to try and get your hands on. So, really, it, it started as Penfolds really wanted to do when we do dinners, we wanted to have champagne. We wanted to have our white wine portfolio, our red wine portfolio, and then our origins, which originally started with Fortified. So you can have the whole experience with just Penfolds now. So you can have your whole dinner party. So whenever you would come to a Penfolds function, we would start with our champagne, move into our whites, reds, and then finish with our, you know, potentially our 20, 30, or 50-year-old Pawnee ports. I, I I love what you said about the user friendliness of the the champagne because that was definitely something that Michael and I both observed. Is like, you know, as as a wine critic, I, I've had a hard time really understanding the appeal of a lot of rosé champagne. Like I've tasted some Krug rosé champagne where it's just like, yeah, it's it's good, but like it, it's void of any of the like the redness that you get from Pinot Noir. The thing that you really love about rosé and the thing that um, you know, yeah. I really loved about the the rosé champagne was that it it had the red fruit and it had like a little bit of sweetness to balance the, the tannin. And Michael schooled me a little bit on on that part of like the rosé champagneness of it. And it's it's really good. We both really dug it. 
And obviously with Peter, the chief winemaker, he had a real um, fascination. So I guess his fascination, even though he's the, the, the chief winemaker of a big group, his love is everything champagne and everything Pinot. Um, and he used to craft, when he first started originally, let's say 20, 25 years ago, um, he actually started making the wines at McGill. So a lot of the Pinot we were taking was from the Adelaide Hills. So it is a it is a little bit bolder and a little bit stronger than than what we would generally get from places like Tasmania in Australia, which is a little bit sort of um, uh, it's a, it's it's much cooler climate, um, it's a tighter structure, it's finer. Whereas the Adelaide Hills Pinots are a little bit more sort of bolder and stronger, and Peter really likes that, enjoys that. So um, they're not dry red esque but they're a little bit firmer and a little bit darker and they tend to have a little more tannin. So he really definitely likes that style of Pinot and believes bringing that into the, uh, into the champagne mix as well. So that's, that's a real true craft of, of, of Peter and his style as well, what he actually likes. So, and that's what he's crafted in the, in the rosé. So we also tasted uh, some Chardonnay uh, yesterday. Uh, Andre, I can see uh, because we can see each other uh, on video, three one one audio yeah. only. Yep. Um, you had a little bit of Chardonnay there. There's got to be a love uh, of, of Chardonnay at Penfolds as well. Am I am I right about that? Correct. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the three one one. And then we've obviously got two higher grade Chardonnays um, aside the one that you're actually drinking now. So well, the, yeah, the- again. The feather that can go into your cap is that uh, Michael is one of the, the last remaining members of the ABC club. I don't think I'm a last. I think there's tons of us, but that's okay. You keep saying that. I mean, you know, you surround yourself with enough crazy people and you don't take a look at all the other people who are not around you. I mean, anyways, crazy people is, is the, 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 the thesis there. Um, anyways, Michael actually had nice things to say about the Chardonnay yesterday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, was, think... there, was a, there's, there seems you. to be, uh, as far as as the few Chardonnays that I've tasted out of Australia of late, there seems to be a nice pullback from oak, uh, which used to be a big problem in the, in the nineties, uh, where just oak, you were just hammering, uh, Chardonnay with, with oak completely, uh, that lasted into the two thousands. And it seems as we hit, uh, we, we turn the corner into, into two ten. Uh, there seems to be a change in style in Australia. Is that something I'm dreaming of, or am I just getting used to it? Or has one hundred one hundred percent correct? Um, I think when we first started making Chardonnays, um, you know, quite obviously aimed at a certain market. A lot of those were interjected into the U.S. market. Um, you know, big, you know, yellow, buttery which I'm not mistaken, probably is still a style in the, in the U S from what I've seen personally. Yes. It's so still, no, it's still, pulling, it's still pulling back a bit though. It, it, it is starting to pull back everywhere a little bit, but I mean, Kistler still exists. I think, Kistler still exists. And I, yes. But I think, you know, and the Mondavi of the world and the Jackson family and some of those wines as well. But I think what you're seeing in the U.S. is potentially a new wave of winemaker as well, which is pulling back on those as well. So they tend to be younger. And, uh, you know, I've looked at quite a few Chardonnays from the coast and Sonoma and Alexander Valley and um, even even further north up in Osh- uh, Oregon and Washington. And, you know, they're really pulling back and they're really letting the fruit give more expression which is what we tend to do here as well so so yeah really it was probably in the 90s the 2000s that we really started to say well we're not we're not going down this path um uh, and the and the white wine maker here who's been part of penfolds he's 38 years so he's been with the business for 38 years crafting wines he started in red wine production and then moved across into uh into white wine and now crafts all 100% 100% of our Chardonnays and he has this real fascination with you know tightness and steeliness and and picking fruit um, exceptionally not exceptionally early but very early before there's any damage from sun you know we've really gone um, I think if you look at our first Yatana in 2005 which is our top echelon um, Chardonnay you know it was from McLaren Vale now nearly you know, ninety to one hundred percent of our um, top end Chardonnay come from Tasmania. Hmm. You know, Tasmania, oh, Tasmania is closer. Is closer you guys have to a, the you have a vineyard out in, Char- in Tasmania as well. A- absolutely. 
So, you know, we have vineyards uh, wherever there's a place to grow grapes, we have vineyards. Um, and Tasmania is where we're going because it's, 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 it's quite a funny, it's quite, it's quite not funny, it's quite an interesting place because the west coast of Tasmania is quite wet, whereas once you get about halfway through Tasmania, it gets quite dry. But the beautiful thing about Tasmania on the eastern side is where a lot of vineyards are growing. It's cool but it's not hugely wet. Yes, it, yes, it has, has rainfall, but it's not really that wet. It has the same rainfall as we do here, close to the same rainfall as we do here in South Australia. So it's quite dry, but it is beautiful and cool, so it's great for growing grapes. But it's great for growing Pinot and Chardonnay. So most of our Chardonnays now, that 311 that you showed me before, yep. was originally from Tumbarumba. So Tumbarumba is the highlands or the snow fields or the snow. So if you would come to Australia during the, during the winter, you would go to places like Tumbarumba, which is the highlands. So it snows in those vineyards. So, you know, higher altitude, cooler climate, um, beautiful part of the world. So 311 originally started in Tumbarumba. I think 2017, if you got that 311,000, uh, in 2017, the 311 was actually Tumbarumba on it. But because we've had to expand it, we now uh, use Tumbarumba, Southern Victoria, and parts of Tasmania uh, as well. So, um, yeah, we've, we have beautiful um, resources of Tasmania, but it's all further south. Yeah, some of my favorite so, pinots out of Australia have come from, uh, from Tasmania. As just yeah, that cool, so, just that, that cool climate. Uh, and um, the Chardonnays are beautiful as well. And I've had some sparkling from there as well. Uh, it's just so our, our Pinot is 100%. So as I was saying earlier, Peter loved the Adelaide Hills Pinot, but it was a little bit more sort of dry reddish and sort of warmer region, whereas now we've gone to Tasmania, 100% of the Penfolds sort of cellar reserve and the small amounts of Pinot that we actually do make um, are all 100% Tasmanian now because of the environment, the conditions, and obviously, as we know, um, things in parts of the world are tar- starting to warm up. So everyone tends to be uh, drifting further south in, in, in regions or, you know, in your part of the world, probably going further north. We obviously, don't see, in we, we obviously don't see enough Penfold wines uh, <clears throat> in uh, in Ontario. I, I, you know, wandering through the LCBO, I don't see a lot. We see, uh, we see the, the entry level, we see the entry level Cab Shiraz pretty regularly, but like that's about, yeah, like I was really excited to get the wines that were that were sent to us. Like, we, like I'd love, I'd love to try some of these pinots as well. So <laughs> we'll see if we can. Uh, we can see. We can see. Definitely see if we can do something there. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. I'd love to try that. Yeah. Well, Andrew, um, yeah. I'm sure we could probably keep talking like on and on and on. There was a, so much information. I really appreciate you taking time out of uh, your great. day to, um, to to just talk to us a bit about the company and like what's going on. Um, and it was a pleasure to, you know, just get some of the history and some of your history as well. So I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Anytime. And, uh, always feel free to, um, jump on board anytime. I can always give you further updates later in the year. And, um, and again, every, every single year I head to California as well. So, uh, you know, from September, October, November, I'm actually in Napa as well. So, okay, uh, but we got to get very to- similar time frame. We got to get oh, you to. Do we got to get you to Toronto or to Niagara? That's the next thing that we got to get. No, yeah, we well, to just invited us to Napa with him. So <laughs> why don't you just take that as the invite? Hey, we've got a great place in Napa as well, which we uh, which we use for for hanging out with uh, with customers as well. So it's right in the heart of Rutherford. So uh, yeah, Ooh, if you nice. ever do come that way, we can uh, we can certainly set you up in uh, in something uh, which you'd Ro- be accustomed to probably. Road trip. Road trip. Well, Andre, that was a lot of fun. Uh, learned a lot of things, and you almost had the story of the Grange correct. Well, I did. He just had way more details, and that was the thing where no, when no, I no, checked, no, 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 the part you said was it was made all in secret. It wasn't made in secret. It was made in three years. It was made in secret. Okay, well, fine. Okay, fine. We want to split hairs on that. I, I had the important parts of the story. I had the cinematic parts of the story correct. I'm gonna. I'm going to I'm going to uh take a victory lap on that one. All right, you do that. <laughs> that makes you happy. Um uh, th- that was yeah, that was um a lot of fun. I'm looking forward for us to talk to Andrew again and I'm still like surprised that you dug that warm climate chardonnay. 
Um, I, I, it was the lowest scoring of the, uh, of the three wines. Um, I, I, as I said, I gave it a thumbs up. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I gravitate a hundred percent towards it. Uh, no, that sure I try some of that stuff from Tasmania that, uh, that's, that's going on. I know that one's partially from Tasmania, but I'd love to try one of their, of their Tasmanian origin wines. I think that'd be great. You know what? I, I'm going to just like throw it down there is I would love to taste the entire lineup of Penfold's wines. Like it was literally like, like listening to someone talk about Pokemon cards there. Like how many different wines does Penfold's make? And like just the, the, the worldwide experimentation, I think is something that is fascinating. But uh, anyways, we, we digress. This has been a very long episode. That interview was, we went in with a, a plan for it to be kind of short and sweet, but Andrew ended up being such a, a great, uh, great talker that we just let it run. So, yeah, had some, you had some great stories to tell. So, I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, and we'll be back again in two weeks' time to... for our two hundred and uh, sorry for our three hundred and fiftieth episode. Really, holy! Yeah, the time gone. Yeah, no kidding. It, um, I don't know if we're going to do anything special. We've never really done anything special for the milestones. It just it sort of popped up with uh, the new podcasting platform we're using. I'm able to track the episode numbers a little bit better. <laughs> Anyways, um, if you do want to make sure that we survive for another 350 episodes, help us out on Patreon. Patreon.com slash two guys talking wine. I'm at Andre Wine Review all over the place. AndreWineReview.ca. And I'm Michael Pincus of MichaelPincusWineReview.com. You can find me as the great guy on most places and Michael Pincus Ryan review on others. Um, my only question to you, Andre, before we, uh, before we say goodbye is, you know, the, you know, num- your first anniversary is, is paper and then there's cotton and all that. What is 350? 350? Jeez, how am I supposed to know that? Who thought we were going to make it this far? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Two Guys Talking Wine on iTunes. Two Guys Talking Wine is produced by Jim Ray, Adam Duran, and Ken Little.